In this lecture, we shall discuss the procedure for a summary criminal trial in Ghana. The procedure for a summary criminal trial in Ghana. In Ghana, as far as our criminal trials are concerned, there are some offenses that we can try summarily. And there are some offenses that we say that we try those offenses by indictment. So if it's a summary offense, the procedure we use is what we refer to as summary trial. Summary trial. Usually there are a number of offenses in the 30 that we try summarily. Uh, what is the procedure for summary trial? What is the procedure for summary trial? I'll proceed to give an overview of summary trial in Ghana. I'll try and condense the various stages from the beginning all the way up to when the accused is sentenced. I'll give the overview first, and then I'll proceed to give a detailed explanation of what each of the stages entail. So by way of an overview, if the case is supposed to be tried summarily, and it's a criminal case in Ghana, there are some preliminary matters that the court first deals with. And when I say preliminary matters, what I mean is that the case is going to be called an open court. Then the prosecution will announce their presence. So let's say the case will be called an open court. The Republic versus let's say Chrissy Mensa. And the prosecution will announce themselves in court that I mean they are present. So they are, these are the preliminary matters. And if the prosecution announced they ourselves that they are in court, and then we have to find out whether the accused is also in court. If the accused is in court, the accused would also announce their presence. Yes, you see Mensa, the accused person. And if the accused is not in court, then a bench warrant has to be issued for the arrest of the accused person. If the accused is present, then we have to direct the accused to stand in the dock. So we'll, we'll, we'll deal with these details, but what I wanted to know now is that there are some preliminary matters that the courts will have to deal with. Beyond the preliminary matters, if the accused is in court and the accused stands in the dock, and the accused is in court, then the next thing will be for the taking of the plea of the accused person. Over here, we'll decide on whether the accused, the accused is going to be whether he's guilty, not guilty, guilty with explanation. We'll look at all of that when we get the taking of the plea. And this is just by way of an introductory overview to summary trial. After the preliminary matters, when the case is called in open court, accused is present, then we have to move to taking of the accused person's plea. And like I said, as for the plea is open to the accused person, when we get to the detailed aspects, we realize that at that point, the accused can plead not guilty, meaning he's not guilty of the offense. The accused can plead guilty as well and say that, well, the Lord, I'm guilty. And over there, the court will report a plea of guilty, which shall come to the conviction. The accused can also say that he is guilty with explanation. Over there, you say guilty, you add the explanation. We'll see whether the explanation you have given is consistent with the plea of guilty or not. The accused may also want to plead double jeopardy, meaning that he has already been tried and convicted of that offense or been tried and acquitted of that offense, which I explain this in detail. And then the accused may also plead, there could also be a plea as to jurisdiction, saying that this case has been commenced in the wrong form. So, so that is just by way of an introductory overview for the second step. Like I said, the first step is that we deal with the preliminary matters where the case will be called in open courts. 
Then the second stage is that we take the plea of the accused person. Now, after the plea of the accused person is taken, if the accused person pleads guilty, then the plea of guilty shall constitute a conviction. So the accused will have to be convicted on his own plea. The court will say that accused person convicted on his own plea, meaning you pleaded guilty yourself and we are convicting you on your own plea. And at this point, the trial will come to an end. This is what in some books we refer to as the first mode of ending trial. First mode of ending trial. What if the accused person pleads not guilty? If the accused person pleads not guilty, he's saying that he's not liable for the offense, he's saying that he's innocent, then the prosecution will proceed to give the facts of the case. Lord, on the 13th of December, it's about 2 p.m., we saw Chrissy Mensah here doing this and this and this and this. So he now gives the facts to the court. When the facts are given to the court, usually, if the accused person has a lawyer, the accused person too will give their own version of the facts and then they will apply for bill. They give their own version of the facts, usually they will be denied the offense and then bill will be considered. So because the accused is saying, I'm not guilty. I want to prove my innocence in this case. So let's, let's, let's go into the full trial. So if you're not guilty, then the next thing is that you must apply for bill or the court can consider bill on its own. So as the bill is considered, of course, the case will have to now be adjourned because they're saying you are not guilty. So the prosecution will have to now come in, establish the guilt of the accused person. So the case will have to be adjourned. And when I say the case will have to be adjourned, remember that the court may or may not grant the bill. So when we get to adjournment, we'll look at the timelines for adjournment. How long the court will adjourn? would depend on whether the accused is in custody, that is, if he has been granted bail or not. If the accused is in custody, that is, if bail has been refused, there's a timeline for bail to be, there's a timeline for an adjournment. If the accused is in custody too, there's a timeline for adjournment. So, let us do a recap from what I have said so far up to this point. For some trial, we do, we deal with preliminary matters. Then, we take the plea of the accused person. Guilty, not guilty, guilty of explanation. We look, we look at all those pleas. If the accused person pleads guilty, the accused will be convicted on his own plea. And if the accused person pleads not guilty, the prosecution will have to give the version of their facts. Then after that, the accused person, if he has a lawyer, would also give a version of their own facts, usually denying the offense, and then they may apply for bill. The bill may or may not be granted. After the application of bill has been dealt with, then the next stage is for the court to adjourn. Because the prosecution has, they are still maintaining that, the prosecution is still maintaining that the accused person is guilty. So if the prosecution is still maintaining that the accused person is guilty, then we have to adjourn and then allow the prosecution to now come and prove the guilt of the accused person. So when we adjourn, the court usually order at the adjournment stage that the prosecution should file what we call disclosures. Disclosures will explain them in detail. Every evidence that the prosecution intends to rely on for the case, all the witnesses that they intend to call to prove the guilt of the accused person, they should file everything in the court, bring everything to the court, and serve copies on the accused person. You say you have eight witnesses to call. You say that this is what they are all about to say to prove the guilt of the accused person. We don't want you to come and take the accused person by surprise. Follow the disclosure, follow everything and serve it on the accused person before we return to court for what we call case management conference. At the case management conference, the disclosures as filed by the prosecution, we will go through them and then we we'll set down the timetables for the trial to begin. That's because we now have everything that the prosecution intends to rely on. We see that they have eight witnesses, so the trial shall take maybe four days. And these are the dates for the court. Everybody should take notes. So that is what we call case management conference. At that time, the court must now go over every exhibit that every witness statement that has been filed by the prosecution and then now fix timelines for the hearing of the case. So, from the beginning, I said we do a preliminary matters. 
we come to the plea of the accused person, and the accused pleads guilty, the trial will end, and the accused pleads not guilty, the prosecution will give their facts. If the prosecution gives their facts, the accused person, if he has a lawyer, usually would also give the version of their facts. If they give the version of the facts, usually deny the offense, the court will have to consider bail. As the bill is considered, then there has to be an adjournment. After adjournment, then the prosecution will have to file disclosures and serve all on the accused person at least. And they will deal with the number of days that they must serve same on the accused person before the case management conference. Then we shall go through the case management conference. After the case management conference, it means the case is ready to be heard. The trial is ready to begin. At the case management conference, the next thing is that when we come to court again, then the prosecution will have to open their case. They will open their case by calling their witnesses, PW1, PW2, PW3, PW4, to call all their witnesses, prosecution witness 1, prosecution witness 2, prosecution witness 3, to call all their witnesses. As I call in all their witnesses, then it means that the prosecution, after opening their case, will have to now close their case. So the case for the prosecution, to call their witnesses, usually the last witness they will call will be the investigator. As I call in the investigator, then the prosecution will have to close their case. After the close of case of the prosecution, the accused person may make what we call a submission of no case to answer. A submission of no case to answer. You can say that, my lord, if you look at the case that the prosecution have, I mean, they, what they are, what they are presented, they have, they have woefully failed to establish some serious elements of this particular offense. The offense is murder. They've not even been able to establish that there's a dead body or the offense is rape. They've not been able to show the age of the victim. He has not been able to show any penetration of the vagina by the penis, even when it is raped. So they fail to prove an essential element of the offense so that this person can make a submission of no case to answer. And my Lord, I do not even have to answer anything at all because they have not been able to establish a homophagic case against me, the accused person. Now, if the submission of no case to answer is upheld, then the accused shall be acquitted and discharged. This is what we usually refer to as the second mode of ending trial. But if the submission of no case to answer is refused, then it means that the accused, there's a case for you to answer. So you must now come and also open your defense. So the next stage, if a submission of no case to answer is refused, is that the accused will have to open his or a defense. After the accused opens his defense, he has to call his witnesses to that he intends to use to establish his case. After that, the accused will have to close his case. After the close of case of the defense, then it means that what it means at that stage is that everybody has presented their respective pieces of evidence. Prosecution, we have your evidence. Accused to, we have your evidence. Then both parties would have to now address the courts. Address the court based on every evidence that you have presented so far. Prosecution, tell us why the accused is guilty. Accused, tell us why you are innocent. If I, after you've addressed the court, the next stage is for the court to pass judgments. And the judgments could either be an acquittal or it could be a conviction. If the accused person is convicted, then it means that the court has found the guilty of the offense. Then the accused may now have to do what you call plea of clemency. Tell the court that you are a first offender, you are a father, you have five children, they are all below 10 years, this and this, so they shouldn't give you a very hard sentence. You are pleading for clemency. Then the prosecution too will also have their say regarding the sentence. After that, the court will now sentence the accused person. So I've condensed the whole process, the summary trial, into 17 points over here. I started with the preliminary matters. I then proceeded to deal with the taking of the plea. I dealt with what will happen if the accused pleads guilty, that he'll be convicted on his own plea. I dealt with what will happen if the accused pleads not guilty. Prosecution will have to give their facts. I dealt with the fact that if the accused pleads not guilty, then bill will have to be considered. As number five, 
that after that, there's supposed to be an adjournment. I mentioned I'll deal with this into detail. As for the adjournment, I dealt with the fact that the prosecution will have to file their disclosures. After the filing of the disclosures, we shall have what we call the case management conference. As a case management conference, it means that timelines have not been set for the trial to begin. So the next time we come to court, it will be case for the prosecution. As number nine, prosecution have to present their case, all of their witnesses, PW1, PW2, we all have to leave their evidence and they'll be cross examined. As of that, accused person may make a submission of no case to answer. And number 10, number 11, if the submission of no case to answer is upheld, then accused shall be acquitted and discharged. This is the second mode of ending the trial. Now, if it is refused, we move to number 12. Then the accused shall be required to open his defense. Number 13 is the case for defense. As the accused too has called all their respective defenses, then both parties will not have to address the courts. After addressing the courts, the next stage is for judgments. And for the judgment, the accused person may either be convicted or may be acquitted. If the accused is convicted, then we are going to have a plea of clemency and both accused. After pleading clemency, the prosecution to have their say required in the sentence. Then after that, the court would sentence the accused person. This is the overview, and I shall now proceed to deal with a detailed explanation of each of the steps. Each of the steps. Each of the steps. So, we shall now proceed to deal with the first step, which is elaborate, which is the preliminary matters. The preliminary matters. So for the preliminary matters, we said, this is the procedure for summary trial, remember. Preliminary matters, the case will be called in open court to the public. At the first stage, our number one stage, the accused, the prosecution and the accused will have to announce their presence in court. And remember that if the accused person is absent, then bench warrant may be issued for the arrest of the accused person. Criminal trials are very serious. If the case is caught and the accused is not in court, you are disrespecting the courts. A bench warrant will be issued for your arrest because you must be present for the criminal trial to go on. But I want you to even note that under Section 70 of the Criminal and Other Offenses Act 1960 Act 30, there are some instances in Ghana where the court may dispense with the personal attendance of the accused. If it is one of those instances where under Section 70 of the Act 30, the court has dispensed with the personal attendance of the accused, then there will be no need for the court to issue a bench warrant. But if the accused is present, he shall be directed to stand in the dock. An accused who is present, who is present and not represented by a lawyer, he shall be asked if he intends to engage the service of a lawyer. This is a very critical step. Because the criminal trial has severe consequences. So if the accused is not present, is present, but doesn't have a lawyer, ask the accused, do you intend to engage the service of a lawyer? And if the accused answers in the affirmative that he intends to engage the service of a lawyer, then the case will have to be adjourned. For the accused to be afforded a reasonable time to engage the service of a lawyer. But if the accused answers in the negative and he says that he does not intend to engage a lawyer, that's when the court shall proceed to deal with the matter. At the preliminary stage, it's also important to note that the court also determines its jurisdiction to sit on the matter. The court determines its jurisdiction to sit on the matter. So preliminary stage this is what we deal with. The case is called an open court with a public versus a crazy mensah. For the kitchen will announce their presence. The Lord, DSP, so and so, for the prosecution, and accused person to your lawyers in court to announce the presence, and we, we find out whether the accused is in court. If the accused is absent, we shall issue a bench warrant for the arrest of the accused person. Unless the personal attendance of the accused has been dispensed with under section 70 of the 30. 
If that cruise president, he shall be directed to stand in the dock. If he doesn't have a lawyer, he shall be asked if he intends to engage the service of a lawyer. If he says yes, the court shall adjourn and afford the accused person reasonable time to engage the service of a lawyer. But if he answers in the negative and says, no, I do not intend to engage a lawyer, then the, the case will have to proceed. And the penalty state, usually the court also determines its jurisdiction to sit on the matter. So this is what I discussed at the first stage of the summary trial as point one, pending nine matters. Point two deals with the taking of the plea. So when I say the plea, what do we mean? And what really transpires at that stage? I'll deal with the legal process at that stage. So by we are assuming that the accused is in court, the case has been called, and the accused is standing there in the court. So what will happen? The charge will be read to the accused person by the clerk of the court. That's count one. Murder, contrary to se section, no, murder cannot be tried summarily. So count one stealing, contrary to section 124 of the Criminal Offenses Act 1960 at 29. Then we'll give the particulars that on or about 15th of May 2021, you, Kofi Mensa, you did this and this and this and you appropriated this dishonestly, which does not belong to you. They read it out to you and you stole the mobile phone belonging to this person. And after that, when it's read, it will be read in English to you first, and it will be interpreted in the language that a accused person understands. And then, in the read count one to you, stealing, contrary to section 124, each one that they read, they will ask you to plead to each of the charges. So the accused can plead personally, and the law also allows the accused to plead through the lawyer. We're taking on the plea. The child will be read out to the accused person by the clerk. It will be read out first in English and then interpreted in the language that the accused person understands. After all the counts have been read and interpreted, the accused will be asked to plead to the charge. And remember, like I'm saying, it will be read in English and interpreted in the language that the accused person understands. And remember, the accused can plead personally and can also plead through a lawyer. What are the options available to the accused person if the accused person intends to plead? If you look at section 171, subsection 4 of the Act 30, it deals with the plea of not guilty. So the accused can plead not guilty. If the accused pleads not guilty, then it means that the court will have to proceed and take the evidence in the case. So if you plead not guilty, it means that you are saying that you are innocent and that the prosecution, what they brought against you, they cannot establish the offense. So in that case, the court will have to proceed to take its evidence in that particular case. So let's go and look at section 171, subsection 4 of the Criminal and Other Offenses Act 1960 at 30 and see what it says. So, section 1, subsection 4 of that 30, this is what it says. If you look on the screen, you can see what section 171, subsection 4 says. It says that where the plea is one of not guilty, the court shall proceed to hear the case. That is the input of section 171, subsection 4. Did the accused plead not guilty? Then the court shall proceed to hear the case. And as I've explained, when you plead not guilty, then the prosecution at that point would have to give their version of the facts. And then also, the accused will also have to give their own version, usually denying the offense. And then the court will now have to consider the issue of bail. But what if the accused person refuses to plead? Look at section 171, subsection 5, which is also on the screen right now. It says as follows. 
the word the accused or the counsel for the accused refuses to plead, or if the accused does not appear and the court decides to hear the case in the absence of the in accordance with section 117, a plea of not guilty shall be entered, and the plea so entered shall have effect as if it had been actually pleaded. So when the accused are called upon to plead also, and you refuse to plead, see what section 171, subsection 5 of that text is saying. It says where the accused or counsel for the accused refuses to plead, or if the accused does not appear and the court decides to hear the case in the absence of the accused in accordance with section 170, a plea of non guilty shall be entered, and a plea so entered shall have effects as if it had actually been pleaded. So that is what section 171, subsection 5 of the activity says. It deals with the consequence of the accused person refusing to plead. Now the next thing. So we've dealt with the first option of being to the accused person if he has to plead. That he can plead not guilty. And we've seen the import of the plea of not guilty under section 171, subsection 4. That where the plea is one of not guilty, the court shall proceed to hear the case. And we've seen the import of an accused person refusing to plead, section 171, subsection 5, the court shall proceed to hear the case and treat that refusal as a plea of not guilty. What if the accused person pleads guilty? And the provision to read over here is section 199 of that 30. It is very critical, and so I'll let us take a look at section 199 of that 30 and see what it says. Section 199 of that 30, this is what it says. It deals with the plea of guilty. Section 199, subsection 1. Where the accused pleads guilty to a charge, the court, before accepting the plea, shall if the accused is not represented by counsel, explain the it, Explain the name accused, explain to the accused the nature of the charge and the procedure which follows the acceptance of a plea of guilty. When the accused pleads guilty to a charge, the court, before accepting the plea, shall, if the accused is not represented by counsel, explain to the accused the nature of the charge and the procedure which shall follow the acceptance of a plea of guilty. So it means right here the court will tell you, accused, if you are saying you are guilty, this is what follows after the plea of guilty. You are going to be convicted and this is what is going to happen. Are you ready? Is that what you want? We must let you know the full consequences because the moment the judge reports that accused is convicted on his own plea of saying that he is guilty, it amounts to a conviction. The judicial ink becomes dry over there and the court cannot do anything. So we must let you know the full consequence of your actions. If you are saying you are guilty, before the court shall accept it, it shall, if the accused is not represented by counsel, explain to the accused the nature of the charge and the procedure to that follows that acceptance of that plea of guilty. We must let you know. This is the procedure that follows. Are you ready? Are you still saying that you want to me to record the plea of guilty? And after that explanation, section 199, subsection 2 says that the accused may then withdraw the plea and then plead not guilty. Okay. After we have told you the consequence and now you've seen that, hey, you can end up in this one by pleading not guilty, by pleading guilty, the accused may then withdraw the plea of guilty and plead not guilty. So, the plea of guilty, section 199 is very critical. The import of what we have from section 199 is that if the accused is not represented, and when he pleads guilty, then the court will have to explain the nature of the charge and the procedure that follows the plea to the accused person. And the accused may then withdraw or still plead guilty. But when the plea of guilty is recorded, what is the implication of that plea of guilty? Section 239 of the Act 30 is very critical for what happens when the accused person pleads guilty. 
If you look on the screen, you see section 239, and this is what it says. A plea of guilty when recorded constitutes a conviction. A plea of guilty when recorded, it shall constitute a conviction. This is section 239 of the Criminal and Other Offenses Act, 1960 Act 30. Once the court records a plea of guilty, it shall constitute a conviction. And so, we have dealt with two options available to the accused person when it's called upon to plead. He says he can plead not guilty, and he's in the implication of not guilty under section 171 and section 4 from that 30. He said when you plead not guilty, the court shall proceed to take evidence. But if you refuse to plead, as well, the court shall also record a plea of not guilty and proceed to take the evidence to hear the case. What if the accused pleads guilty? The court shall, if the accused is not represented, explain the nature of the charge and the procedure that follows of the plea to the accused person. And so that, section 199 says the accused may withdraw or still plead guilty. And when a plea of guilty is recorded, what is the implication? Section 239 of Act 30 says a plea of guilty when recorded shall constitute a conviction. But there are times when the accused person comes to court and then pleads guilty, but they add some explanation. This is very common. Because sometimes the accused person thinks that he's guilty. So he says, I'm guilty. But I have an explanation. And sometimes when you listen to the explanation, there are two things that can happen. Either the explanation can be consistent with the plea of guilt, or it can be inconsistent with the plea of guilty. Sometimes you say that you have been charged with stealing. And you know what stealing means under section 125 of that 29. A person who steals a thing who dishonestly appropriates a thing of which is not the owner. Then you plead guilty to the child of stealing. But you say you have an explanation. But the explanation you give, that telling the court that, yes, you went to the house on that day to take the vehicle, he didn't take his permission, but this vehicle belongs to you. You are the owner of the vehicle. You have the document. But the only problem is that the day when you took the vehicle from him, you were not, you didn't inform him about the vehicle, about taking the vehicle because you just spare key. And the question over here is whether this explanation you've given, is it consistent with the plea of guilty? If it's inconsistent, because you're saying you're the owner of the vehicle, you have the document, you have a spare key. Since it's, if the court finds that it is inconsistent with the plea of guilty, then the court must report not guilty for the offense. So, let us deal with guilty with explanation. Guilty with explanation. And this one, it says, dealt with under section 199, subsection 4 of the Act 30. And one under section 199, subsection 4, C. It reads as follows, and you can see. Now, where the accused pleads guilty, but as words indicating that the accused may have a defense, that the accused may have a defense. So, where the accused pleads guilty, but as words indicating that the accused may have a defense, or so indicates in answer to the court, the courts shall enter a plea of non guilty and record it and record it as having been entered by order of the court. So you see, where the accused is guilty, but add words indicating that the accused may have a defense. Like I said, you've been charged with stealing, and you have said you are guilty, but the explanation you have given shows that you are the owner. And one of the elements for stealing is that you must not be the owner of the item. So if we look at this explanation that you have given, if we analyze it, it makes it look like the accused has a defense. So the accused pleads guilty, but as words indicating that he may have a defense, or indicates in answer to the court, the court shall enter a plea of not guilty, and record it as having been so entered by order of the court. Meaning that it is by order of the court that the court wrote the not guilty. That the accused said he is guilty, but when we listen to his explanation, we realize that the explanation has given is inconsistent with the plea of guilty. So uh, the court, we have recorded not guilty. Where the trial will go on. So, section 199 of section 4 deals with 
guilty with explanation. And like I've said, an accused may plead guilty. My ad words indicating that he may have a defense. And if the ad words indicating he may have a defense, that's the 199. That's the first says that then the court may record a plea of not guilty. But if the explanation does not amount to a defense, so let's say that you, you, you have been charged with stealing and then you say that yes, on that day you took, you went to the house to steal the vehicle because your child needed money for school fees and that's the only way you could get money to go and steal the car and sell. This plea that you have given, this explanation you have given, it is consistent with the plea of guilty. It doesn't amount to a defense. Now when the courts are recorded and then convict the accused person. So you've got three options so far available to the accused person. The accused can either plead guilty, not guilty, or guilty with explanation. The accused can also plead double jeopardy. Double jeopardy. And this is actually a fundamental human right under the 1992 constitution. In a separate lecture, we shall deal with the full defense of double jeopardy. But what the defense means is that if the accused person says that I have once upon a time been already tried for this offense, and then I have already been convicted or I have been acquitted, then, Lord, you cannot try me again for this same offense. You have brought me back for healing. This same stealing of the mobile phone belonging to Asim Asim I have already been tried. I have already been sentenced before, and I've come back. So in this instance, I'm pleading all three or four convicts, meaning I've already been convicted, or I'm pleading all three or four acquit, meaning I've already been acquitted. I've already been tried, and I've been acquitted on these same facts. And like I said, this is a fundamental human rights, which. We will see in our 1992 constitution under Article 19, Laws 7. Like I said, we'll, this will be dealt with in a separate lecture, but let me just read what Article 19, Clause 7 says. Article 19, Clause 7 says as follows, and you can see it on the screen. It says, No person who shows that he has been tried by a court for a criminal offense and either acquitted or convicted. So they can be tried for that offense or for any other criminal offense of which he could have been convicted at the trial, you see? So no person who showed that he had been tried by a court of competent jurisdiction for a criminal offense and he had either been acquitted or he had been convicted, he shall again be tried for that offense or for any other criminal offense of which he could have been convicted at the trial for the offense except on the order of a superior court in the course of an appeal or review proceedings relating to the conviction or acquittal. So this is what the double jeopardy rule says. It's an Article 19, Clause 7 of the Constitution. If you look at the Criminal Offenses, Criminal and Other Offenses Act 1960 at 30, Section 113 also has language to the effect as follows, and I read, and this is in Act 30. In accordance with Clause 7 of Article 19 of the Constitution. So you see, they are even making reference to what the Constitution says. In accordance with Clause 7 of Article 19 of the Constitution, a person who has been, who has been once tried by a court of competent jurisdiction for an offense and convicted or acquitted of the offense shall not be tried again on the same facts for the same offense or any other offense of which that person would have been lawfully convicted at the first trial, unless a retrial is ordered by a court having the power to do so. So you see, that that person shall not be tried, see, shall not be tried, again, on the same facts for the same offense or any other offense, of which that person could have been lawfully convicted for the first, at the first trial, unless there's a retrial that has been ordered. So if an accused is asked to plead, the accused can plead, and Lord, I've already been tried of this offense and I've been already acquitted. It's all three five acquit, but I've already been tried and convicted. This is even a full defense that will be discussed in a separate lecture where you see that we've discussed it together with the exceptions. 
But for now, know that is one of the options available to that each person. So you've seen four options. You can plead guilty, not guilty, guilty is explanation, and double jeopardy. Then that, that the court can also consider its jurisdiction at that particular stage. And this is seen from section 49 on that 30. What does section 49 on that 30 say? It says as follows. That where a cause is commenced in a place other than where it ought to have been commenced, the cause may be tried in that place unless the defendant objects. Unless the defendant what? Objects. So where a cause is commenced in the place other than that in which it ought to have been commenced, the cause may be tried in that place unless the defendant objects to this at or before the time when the defendant is called upon to plead or to state an answer to the case. Some persons have argued and said that this is not a, one of the options available to the accused person to plead, but it is in the act. Section 49 says that when that before or when the accused is called upon to plead, he can object to that jurisdiction. Let's look at the language very well. Where a cause is commenced in the place other than that in which it ought to have been commenced, the cause may be tried in that place unless the defendant objects to this act or before the time when the defendant is called upon to plead or to state an answer in the course. So section 49 is very critical as far as the options available to the accused person are concerned. So at this point, we've dealt with about five options open to the accused person when it's called upon to plead. Not guilty, section 171, and section 4 has the implication that the court shall proceed to hear the case. Plea of guilty, section 199. That one, the court will have to explain the nature of the charge to the accused person and the procedure that follows such a plea. When the plea of guilt is recorded, section 239, it shall constitute a conviction. What if the accused pleads guilty with explanation? We shall listen to the explanation and see whether it is consistent with the plea of guilt, guilty or not. If it's consistent with the plea of guilty, the court shall record it as such. But if it is not consistent, then the court will also record it as such. Then another option open to the accused person, double jeopardy. You can say I've already been acquitted or I've already been convicted of this offense. Section 113 of the Act 30 and Section 9, Article 19 plus 7 of the Constitution. And the accused can also plead as to the jurisdiction of the courts. As we saw under Section 49 of the Act 30, that the accused person can, at the time that he's called upon to plead, object to the jurisdiction of the courts. So five options so far. One, not guilty. Two, guilty. Three, guilty with explanation. Four, double jeopardy. Five, plea as to jurisdiction. So, let us proceed and deal with what will happen if the accused person pleads guilty. If the accused person pleads guilty, as we've dealt with already, then the trial, the accused will have to be convicted on his own plea. And as we saw under section 239, the plea of guilty when recorded shall constitute a conviction. When the plea of guilty is recorded, it shall constitute a conviction of the offense. A plea of guilty when recorded shall constitute a conviction of the offense. You've seen it, section 239. That when an accused person pleads guilty, a plea of guilty when recorded shall constitute a conviction. That's why we say that it's the first mode of ending the trial because if you're convicted, You'll be committed on your own plea. So once that happens and you plead guilty and you are convicted on your own plea, the prosecution will now have to give the facts of the case to enable the court to decide the appropriate sentence to pass against the accused person. So the prosecution answer the court that on this day you did this, you steal the wall, you use a plier, you open the door, you stole an amount of money worth this. When we hear the real facts of the case, then we shall decide. The kind of sentence to impose on the accused person. So if the accused pleads guilty at this point, the trial comes to an end. But what if the accused pleads not guilty? If the accused pleads not guilty to the offense, then it means that the courts will have to proceed to hear 
the case, as we've already seen under section 171, subsection 4, which are, we've already dealt with what happens under an instance where the accused person pleads not guilty. Remember section 199, subsection 4. It says that where the accused pleads, section 199, subsection 1, sorry. It says that when the accused pleads guilty to a charge, the court shall, before accepting the plea, if the accused is not represented by a counsel, explain to the accused the nature of the charge and the procedure which follows the acceptance of such a plea of guilty. The accused may then withdraw the plea or not. But remember that that is what happens when the accused person pleads guilty. But we are looking for the instance of what happens when the accused person pleads that he is not guilty for the offense that has been charged. The provision for that is around under section 171, subsection 4. 171, subsection 4. When the accused pleads guilty, not guilty to the offense that has been charged. It says that 171, subsection 4, appearing on the screen. Where the plea is one of not guilty, the court shall proceed to hear the case. Where the plea is one of not guilty, the court shall proceed to hear the case. So that's why I've explained over here that when the accused plea is not guilty to the charges, the prosecution will then have to give the facts of the case because the accused are saying are not guilty. So the prosecution will have to give the facts of the case, they will mention the offense charge, then they will provide a brief reference to the evidence they intend to rely on, They'll, they'll give a brief overview of the evidence they intend to rely on to prove the element of the offense beyond reasonable doubt. And if the accused is also represented by a lawyer, the lawyer for the accused have denied the offense and also give the accused version of the fact, usually denying the offense. And at this point, what will happen? If the accused denies the offense, then we have to consider the issue of bill. Remember, like I said, you are saying you're not guilty. So the prosecution will have to come to court and prove your guilt. So the court will have to consider the issue of guilt. They shall allow you to go home. So that every day you come to the court and come and see the evidence that they have against you. They are saying, you are innocent. And remember that Article 19 of the Constitution. A person is presumed to be innocent until he is proven guilty. We deal with bill in full. The full lecture. But for now, what we know is that if an accused pleads not guilty and the prosecution provides the facts, the court shall then consider the issue of bill. So if the accused pleads not guilty, the prosecution and the accused provide their respective version of the facts, the court shall consider the issue of bill. Usually, at that stage, the lawyer for the accused person will make an oral application for bill. We say, my Lord, we, we hereby make an application for bill for the accused person. Pursuant to section 96, from that 30, then they give the grounds under which they are applying for the bill, mattress under their 30, and then the court may decide whether to grant the bill or not. Always remember that when we deal with bill in detail, you realize that under section 96 of that 30, the grant of bill is at the discretion of the court. We shall deal with that into extenso. But for now, all we know is that if an accused is not guilty and the prosecution provides the facts, the court shall consider the issue of bill. So like I'm saying, the court shall consider the issue of bill. If the accused has a lawyer, the lawyer shall make an oral application for the bill. If he doesn't have a lawyer, the court on its own motion shall consider the issue of bill. And then the court may either grant the accused person bill or remand the accused person in custody. But I always remember that the grant of bill is at the discretion of the court. Now, remember I mentioned in the introduction that the timelines for adjournment will be dependent on whether the accused has been granted bill or not. Let's ask, go to section 169 of the 30. It's 169 of the 30. And what does section 169 of the 30 deal with? It says that and I read, before or during the hearing of a case, the court 
A may adjourn to a certain time and place to be appoint to be then appointed and stated in the presence and hearing of the parties of the respective council then present and in the meantime suffer the accused to go at large or may commit the accused person to prison or may release the accused on the entry into a bond with or without sureties conditioned for the accused person's appearance at a time and place to which the hearing or further hearing is adjourned. The adjournment shall not be for more than 30 days. The adjournment shall not be shall not be for more than 30 clear days, or if the accused person has been committed to prison for more than 14 clear days. So you see the provision here. So take a critical look at section 169, subsection 2. That the adjournment shall not be for more than 30 clear days. Or if the accused person has been committed to prison for more than 14 clear days. It means that if the bill is refused and the accused is remanded into custody, then when you are adjourning, you must not adjourn for more than 14 clear days. In other words, we can't bring you to the court, remind you into custody, and adjourn the case for four months. Why would you do that to an accused person? Why would you do that, that you have refused the accused person bill? Here the case quickly and finish with it too, then you've adjourned the case for three months or four months. The law is not allowing you to do that. The law says under section 169, subsection 2, that the adjournment shall not be for more than 30 clear days, or if the accused person has been committed to prison for more than 14 clear days. And I want some of you to take note of section 169, subsection 3. It says that the day following that on which the adjournment is made shall be counted as the first day. The, the adjournment will be made today, tomorrow will be the first day that we shall count as far as this 14 days is concerned. So that's why I have over here that the accused person, if you are not guilty, you've given your version of the facts, you've applied for bill. Remember, the bill may or may not be granted. If it is granted, it means that you will not be in custody. So in your journey, we shall not adjourn for more than one month. But if you are in custody and you are journey, it shall not be for more than two weeks. But the act uses 30 days and the 14 clear days. So if, it's a, if accused person is in custody, the court cannot adjourn for more than two weeks. But if the accused is on bail, the court cannot adjourn for more than one month. That's the section 169 of the Act 30. Now what happens after the adjournment? Remember we said in the introduction that if you remember in the introduction over here, we mentioned that after the accused person has pleaded not guilty, has the court has considered the issue of bail, and then the case is adjourned, the prosecution will be required to serve on the accused person what we call disclosures. Disclosures, furnish the accused person with the disclosures so that we will know everything that you intend to rely on, everything by way of the witness statement of the accused person or of the prosecution. All, all the things you intend to rely on, serve it on the accused person. Let us see what you intend to rely on. So the accused person will prepare before coming. So serve, these days we don't have any surprise litigation. Serve everything on the accused person and let us see it. And pre in previous times, we didn't have this in the rules. It, it, is, it is because of a practice direction that was given by, that was given. That is when the, this, that, that is when we now started doing the, these, these disclosures. So I'll refer to the practice direction and then I'll read the material portion which deals with the disclosures so that you see what I'm indeed referring to. So this is the practice direction. The headed practice direction to back at disclosures and case management in criminal proceedings. 
Now, for this particular direction, let's go to this particular page and see what it says. Look at the paragraph five of the particular direction. It says as follows. Why the accused person pleads not guilty? Or a plea of not guilty is entered for the accused person for the case to proceed to trial. After the issue of bill is considered, see the emphasis, after the issue of bill is considered, the court shall adjourn for not more than 14 clear days when the accused person is in custody and not more than 30 clear days when the accused person is on bill or case management conference. The day following that on which the adjournment is made shall be counted as the first day. So you see where I have the authority from everything over here should be supported by authority. You are saying that when the court is adjourning, that the prosecution must furnish the accused with disclosures. Where is the authority? It is this practice direction on disclosures in case management in criminal proceedings. And then if you look at the paragraph five of that practice direction, it says that where the accused person pleads not guilty, or a plea of not guilty is entered for the accused person for the case to proceed to trial. After the issue of bill is considered, the court shall adjourn the case for no more than 14 clear days when the accused is in custody. And not more than 30 clear days when the accused person is on bill for case management conference. The day following that on which the adjournment is made shall be counted as the first day. Now look at the paragraph six. The prosecution shall file and serve on the accused person or counsel for the accused person all outstanding materials that require disclosure at least two clear days before the date fixed for the case management conference. So you must not only serve them, but we have also given you the timeline that you must serve them before we have the case management conference. At least two clear days before the date fixed for the case management conference. Listen, take a critical look at the paragraph. The prosecution shall file and serve on the accused person or counsel for the accused person all outstanding materials that require disclosure. So what are the materials that you must even disclose? Look at paragraph 7. They are there. And they've listed everything that you must list that requires you to disclose. If you look at paragraph 7 over here, all the matters that you require, that are required to disclose, have been listed over here. Right. So we shall proceed to our next stage that we are referring to. That is the practice direction, which we have dealt with now. That shows that after the court considers the issue of adjournment, you will have to tell the prosecution that at least two clear days before the date phase for the case management conference, please serve on the accused person everything that you intend to rely on. In fact, it is so important because it even tells you that even evidence that in your, in the favor of the accused person, you must also disclose all those pieces of evidence. Every, don't hide anything for that. So if in the course of your investigation, you came across some evidence that will even inure to the benefit of the accused person, please bring everything. So if you look at some of the examples of things that you must file and disclose, all witness statements that you intend to rely on, people you intend to call as witnesses, save everything on that. Let him see it. Photograph of any real evidence, like cutlass, knife, guns. Bring what, let's see what you are referring to. So I'll see whether this is the gun that I've, I've even seen this kind of gun before. If you have any audio, video evidence, give everything to the accused person. Any evidence also that is also in favor of the accused person, please give it to the accused person. And one provision that I like so much in this particular direction is paragraph 8. It says that the court, on its own motion, on an application by the accused person, may order that any statement, document, or object, or material in possession of the police, or any other law enforcement or investigative body that is relevant to the case, but which the prosecution has not disclosed, be disclosed. You see, it is a fundamental right of the accused person. 
everything that is presumed to be innocent. Why do you want to hide things from him? Everything that you have, even evidence that are even inured to the benefit of the accused person. Paragraph 8 of the process direction is saying that you cannot hide anything from the accused person. And if you hide, the court on its own motion or on the application of the accused person can order you to bring some evidence before the court. So after the case management conference, what happens next? When it is adjourned, then the prosecution will have to come and then open their case. Because now at the case management conference, the court will have to fix its timelines for the case management conference and tell us when the case is going to be heard and everything. So once the court identifies the timelines for the case to be heard, when we return on the next date, it means that the trial is supposed to, to begin. So when we return, evidence for the prosecution. On the agenda date, the prosecution will have to open their case and leave evidence by calling all their witnesses. The witnesses are supposed to swear on oath to tell the truth. You are coming to court to testify against an accused person and it can result in the accused person going to prison. Please do not come to the court and come and lie. So we will require you to swear an oath to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. And, over, and, and that provision is seen in the Evidence Act. Section 61 of the Evidence Act has that provision requiring you the accused, the, you the witness, that when you come to the court, whatever you are coming to say should be the truth and nothing but the truth. We don't want people to come and lie against people. So if you look at the Evidence Act over here, it says that subjects to an enactment or a rule, to the contrary, a witness before testifying, emphasis, before testifying, shall take an oath or affirmation that the witness shall truthfully, shall testify truthfully. And a statement made by a witness without the oath or affirmation shall not be considered as evidence. This is our Evidence Act of Ghana, 1975. It is telling you that a witness before testifying shall take an oath. So before you testify, you must take the oath. And if you testify without taking this oath, then the evidence or whatever you have given before the court shall not be considered as evidence. We don't want people to come and say things without, and then they come and say lies against people. So as you in one of the evidence acts, the subject to an enactment or a rule to the contrary, a rule of law to the contrary, a witness before testifying shall take an oath or affirmation that the witness will testify truthfully and the statements made by a witness without the oath or affirmation shall not be considered as evidence. So that is the import of that. And in practice, if you can, there are different ways people swear. You can swear on the Bible. You can swear on the cross if you're a Catholic. You can swear on the Quran if you're a Muslim. You can swear according to your religious belief. Or you can even swear by affirmation. Swearing by affirmation is for people who do not believe in God or any religion. So when the accused person swear, when the witness swears, then you hear a lot SOB in English, meaning accused swore on the Bible in English. Or my Lord, my Lord SOC in English, and I feel swore the cross in English. So my Lord SOB in English, SOB in Ga, ha. Ah. So we bring the Bible that before testifying before this court, you swear that you shall speak the truth and nothing but the truth. So you say it, swear. And when you swear, you mention your name, I, so, so, and so, before this court, swear on the Bible that any evidence I shall give before this court shall be nothing but the truth. And then we say, my Lord, SOB in English, SOB in God, SOB in tree, SOB in every. So once you swear the oath, it means that you are ready to give evidence. Because remember what the evidence acts says. That any statement made by a witness without the oath of affirmation shall not be considered as evidence. Any statement shall not. So once you have sworn the oath now, it means you are ready to now give the evidence. 
and the swearing is done in the language that the witness will testify. So all the prosecution witnesses that will come, PW1, they'll come and testify. When they come, to give evidence. And then after giving their evidence in chief, they come, evidence in chief means they'll tell you the case they have against the accused person. After the evidence in chief, each of them two will be cross-examined and each of them two will be re-examined if the prosecution wishes to do so. So when the court of the witnesses, there will be evidence in chief by each prosecution witness. And then there will be cross-examination by the accused person. And then there will also be re-examination if the prosecution wishes to have a re-examination. Then that is the case for the prosecution. If prosecution you call all your witnesses, usually the last witness the prosecution will call will be the investigator. So if the investigator comes, he's the one that will come and tender everything because he's the one who conducted the investigation. And then he's the one who gathered everything by way of investigation. He took the statements from the accused person and everything. Usually he'll come and sum up everything when it comes to testify. But there's one thing that you have to note. That while the prosecution witnesses are testifying, the accused person or the lawyer can raise objections during the evidence of the prosecution. So you can object that, my lord, I don't want him to give this evidence, and you give the legal basis for your objection. When you give the legal basis for your objection, then the court may rule on the objection, either uphold it or overrule the objection. If they want to tender a document and you object to the document and the document is rejected, then it will be marked as rejected and placed on record. So they want to tender a particular document. And the document they want to tender, your lawyer says that by law, it's not supposed to be tendered. It's inadmissible. If the court opposes the objection, then the document is going to be marked as rejected and placed on record. Remember I mentioned that the investigator is usually the last witness to be called by the prosecution. If the investigator enters the box and is testifying, usually he's the one who will tender the charge caution statement and the investigation caution statement they took from the accused person. Remember at the police station when they invite you as a suspect, when they invite you and they tell you that they are investigating a child against you, at that point you are not an accused person, you are a suspect. You are in the house. The police pick you up. They take you to the station. I'm investigating a, a, a case of stealing against you. And then I want you to give me the st statement, your statement to the police. That is called an investigation caution statement. At that point, you haven't been charged yet. So you are not an accused person. You are only a suspect. So that statement that is taken from you is now when we take that statement from you and we realize that, well, as the investigation, we think that we must charge you for the offense. We will charge you for the offense now. And after you charge you too, meaning that you are now an accused person, we shall not take another statement from you. And that one is called a charge caution statement. So I want you to understand these two statements that the police usually take from the accused, from, from people. If they invite you for investigation, at that point you are a suspect. And then at that point, the evidence that you gave to the statement that you gave to the police is what you call an investigation caution statement. You be cautioned that you have the right to remain silent and everything and tell us what you have. Tell them it's an investigation caution statement. After that statement and they conduct their investigation and they realize that, no, you are the one that's stealing. They will charge you. And after they charge you too, I want to, they will now take another statement from you. That is called a child caution statement. So usually this investigator who took this statement at the police station, he's the one who tried to tender these statements. And sometimes, unfortunately, the police may be at the police station, maybe they have molested or abused the people before the people ended up making some statements to the police. Sometimes you see police arresting people, bring them before the television, they have been severely beaten, their faces swollen, and they say that under investigation, they are admitted to the charge. Swollen faces, meaning that you are beating them. And if you are beating the people under such circumstances, 
Is it not going to be possible that even though they may not be guilty, they may write in the statement that they are guilty? It is possible. It's possible they may torture you before you put down those statements in your in your in your statements that you are you are the one who confessed to the crime. So if the investigator is about to tender that statement, and that statement contains a confession or a partial confession of a crime. You know, the law requires that all any confession at all made by a person must be made voluntarily. So if you take the statement from the person and it's not voluntarily taken, because under Section 120 of the Evidence Act, any confession must be made voluntarily and must be made in the presence of an independent witness. We want to be sure that whatever the people said to the attestation, it was the, what they intended to see, not that you forced them. And this is required by Section 120 of the Evidence Act. So if you are about to tender these statements, and it contains a confession or a partial confession to the crime, the accused person can object on the basis that that statement was not made voluntarily. And if he says it wasn't made voluntarily, it means that they are impugning the credibility of that statement you want to tender. So the court will have to try that part of the case. So the prosecution will have to call witnesses. And then the independent witness who was there. And they come and tell us that did this person, accused person, give this statement voluntarily or not. So we call this a mini trial. So we have to conduct a trial to determine the admissibility or otherwise of these statements. So we'll call separate witnesses to come and testify in the court so that we'll see whether we want to just admit these statements or not. After all, the witnesses have addressed the court on the admissibility or otherwise of the investigation caution statements, the court will now have to give this ruling on whether the statement is going to be admitted or not. The court will have to consider whether you made a statement voluntarily or not and now give its ruling. So that is what we mean by mini trial. So when you hear mini trial, mini trial means that you're about to tender statements of the accused person and then the accused person is saying that these statements were not given voluntarily because under Section 120 of the Evidence Act, any confession must be given voluntarily. You tortured me. You put me in the room. You didn't give me food for four days. And you now you came to me and I wrote it. And I told him that it was voluntarily made. No, it wasn't volunt voluntarily made. There was no independent witness. So who can testify that this is what I said? One of the accused witnesses that you must conduct a mini trial to determine the admissibility or otherwise of that statement. And after all has been considered, then the court shall not give its ruling on whether the statement is admitted or not. There are times in court when the statement will be refused. When it is refused, the accused will think that then it means that he has won the case. But it's only about the statement. In that same way, when that statement is also admitted, it doesn't mean that you're also guilty. It's only about the statement. The case will have to proceed to its logical conclusion. So this comes as part of the case of the prosecution. Because it is when the prosecution, they call the investigator, usually is the one who now try to turn these statements. And you, as an accused person, you may, I'm not saying you must always object. No. You only object if you think that it contains some confessions which are not obtained voluntarily because they are in breach of Section 120 of the Evidence Act. So after the investigator has come to testify, who is usually the last witness to be called, usually the prosecution wants to close their case. But before they close their case, sometimes they may want to amend some of the charges. Sometimes they leave the evidence in the case and they realize that hmm, if I look at the evidence I have brought and the charges are brought against the accused person, it is possible that maybe I may not be able to prove the offenses that I've brought the accused person for. So they may want to at that point possibly amend or substitute some of the charges that they have brought against the accused person. And so look at section 176 of that case. This is what it says. Where at any stage of a summary trial, before the, before the 
most of the case on the prosecution. It means that you can't close your case and now come and say you want to come and do what I'm about to read. So take notes. Where at any state of a summit trial before the close of the case of the prosecution, it appears to the court that the charge is defective in substance or in form. The court may make an order for the amendment of the charge or by the substitution or addition of a new charge as the court considers necessary to meet the circumstances of the case. So you see, at any state of Bersami trial before the close of prosecution's case, Section 176 of the Act is saying that if it appears to the court that the charge is defective in substance or in form, the court may make an order for the amendment of the charge or by the substitution or addition of a new charge as the court considers necessary to meet the circumstances of the case. And if you look at Section 176, Subsection 2, it says that when the child is amended, the court shall call on accused to plead to the amended charge. So before the prosecution closes their case, after they've called the investigator, all I'm saying is that there's something the prosecution can do before they close their case. And it is that they can amend or substitute the charges. And this is because of section 176. Subsection 1 of that text, we say that where at any stage of a summary trial, before the close of the case for the prosecution, it appears to the court that the child is defective in substance or in form, the court may make an order for the amendment of the charge or by the substitution or addition of a new charge as the court considers necessary to meet the circumstances of the case. Where the child is amended, the court shall call on the accused to plead the amended charge. But remember at that point, the accused has already called, the prosecution have already called some witnesses. So, section 176, subsection 3 says that where the child is amended, the accused may require the recall of the witness or any of them and further cross examine them. Or counsel for the accused and the prosecution shall also have the right to re-examine any of the witnesses on any matters arising out of the federal cross-examination. So I, I have already finished cross-examining all your witnesses. Now you say I'm in your charge. I can say that bring this person back. Let me cross-examine him because I want to defeat these two charges you brought. It's also possible. So remember, before the prosecution closed their case after they've called the investigator, it's not by force. But the law allows them under section 176 of the Act 13 to amend or substitute the charges. After that, the prosecution will have to close their case. They'll have to close their case. And when they close their case, like I said, sometimes it's an offense that there's a very essential element that has to be established. An offense like rape, that you must definitely prove the age of the victim. An offense like defilement, he must prove the age of the victim. And throughout the whole trial, you don't even adduce any evidence to show that the victim is below 16 years in Ghana. It means that you have failed to prove an essential element of the offense. It means that the accused person can make an application that he has no case to answer. So, as if, in other words, if we assume that whatever he said is true, me, I'm not even guilty. So, I should not even be called upon to answer. So, if you look at section 173 of the Acts 30, it says that where at the close of the evidence in support of the charge, it appears to the court that the case is not made out against the accused sufficiently to require the accused to make a defense, the court shall, as to that particular charge, acquit the accused person. Again, where at the close of the evidence in support of the charge, it appears to the court that a case is not made out against the accused, sufficiently to require the accused to make a defense, the court shall, as to that particular charge, acquit the accused. So, Louis says in 173, where at the close of the evidence in support of the charge, it appears to the court that a case is not made out against the accused sufficiently to require the accused to make a defense, 
the court shall ask with that particular charge acquit the accused. If the accused is represented by a lawyer, the lawyer may indicate to the court that he wants to make a submission of no case. The court may then ask the lawyer to make a submission orally when written form and file same at the registry of the court. But some of you will be wondering, what are the grounds on which the court may uphold a submission of no case to answer? Under what circumstances should the court allow a submission of no case to answer and uphold it? I've given you an insight already. I told you that when you fail to prove an essential element of the offense, like the farming, you fail to prove the aid of the victim. But I refer you to the case of State versus Ali Kasena. State versus Ali Kasena. Kasena is spelled K-A-S-S-E-N-A. -S reported in 1962. Ghana Law Reports at page 144, specifically at page 148. It was held that a submission of no case to answer may be upheld. A. When there has been no evidence to prove an essential element in the alleged offense, like I told you, that the evidence over here, you are bringing the person for deferment and it's essential for you to prove the age of the victim. You haven't put, you haven't put any evidence. So when there has been no evidence to prove an essential element in the law of offense, a submission of no case to answer may be upheld. Or let's say you've called witnesses, and all the witnesses, eight of them, are all saying different things. You, the prosecution, you that you have the burden to prove beyond reasonable doubt, even you, eight of the witnesses, are all saying a different thing. One person says that the person was raped as Nima. Another one says it was a Madina. Another one says it was a Choco. Which one is which? So if you read an it says that the court would uphold a submission of no case to answer when the evidence adduced by the prosecution has been so discredited as a result of cross-examination. When the evidence adduced by the prosecution has been so discredited as a result of cross-examination. Or when the evidence adduced by the prosecution is so manifestly unreliable that no reasonable tribunal will safely convict on it that the court may uphold a submission of no case to answer. So, so in actual fact, when the prosecution closed their case and you make a submission of no case to answer and it's upheld, then the case too will end over there. So if it is upheld, then the accused will be acquitted and discharged. And this is what we call the second mode of ending the trial. If you remember our checklist from the beginning, that was number 10, where we mentioned that an accused may make a submission of no case to answer. And if it is upheld, then the accused may be acquitted and discharged. And this is the second mode of ending the trial. But if it is not made, so if it's not by force to make a submission of no case to answer, so if you don't make a submission of no case to answer, or if it is refused, then what will happen? The accused will not have to open the fence. So let's go to the case for the defense. If it is refused, it means that the accused has a case for you to answer. So you must now open your defense. The accused will also open his defense. But there's one fundamental thing I want you to note about the accused person opening the defense. The accused has a right to remain silent. It's a constitutional right. You can say that, my lord, I'll keep quiet. It's a right to remain silent. The accused can also elect to enter the witness box and give evidence on oath. If that, please, this has serious implications. So take notes. You can remain silent and not say anything. You know, nobody can even ask you any question. Or you can elect to swear the oath and give evidence. Or you can elect to remain in the dock where you are standing and give evidence without swearing on oath. This is called an omission statement. And I'm one, I, I believe I might be wondering what, are the, what, what is the difference in terms of the implication for each of these. It has an implication. So I'll take all of them one, once again. If you elect to give evidence on oath, you elect to enter the witness box and give evidence on oath, then 
we will call it as accused testified on oath. And that's one. Once you exercise this right, then you we can cross-examine you, the accused person. So, when you give evidence on oath, when they are swearing to say the truth, that one you can be cross-examined on the evidence you have given. But when you elect to remain in the dock where you are standing, to give evidence without swearing on oath, that it will be recorded as accused makes an omission statement. And when the accused exercises this option, the accused person shall not be cross-examined. So take note, if you elect to give your evidence on oath, you shall be cross-examined. Accused testifies on oath. If you let you remain in the dock and swear without giving evidence on oath, that one will call an omission statement, and then you shall not be cross-examined. What if the accused elects to remain silent? If the accused elects to remain silent, it shall be recorded that accused elects to keep silent. And the accused will not say anything. But one thing you should note is that, so I'll give you three options. When the accused is called upon to open the defense, he can elect to remain silent. He can decide to remain in the dock and give evidence without swearing on oath. Or he can elect to swear the oath and then give evidence. And in that instance, he shall be cross-examined. So, if the accused swears the oath to give evidence, it's called accused testified on oath. If you decide to just stand there and give evidence without swearing on oath, it's called an omission statement. And when you exercise this option, you shall not be cross-examined. But if you exercise the right to remain silent, it shall be recorded as accused elects to keep silent. And remember, regardless of any of the options I've mentioned, let the accused person be choose. The accused can still be allowed to call his witnesses. So if you like to swear the oath and give evidence accused testified on oath, you can still call witnesses. If you let you remain in the dock and give evidence without swearing on oath, you can also call witnesses. If you like to remain silent too, of course, if you want to call witnesses, you yourself, you won't talk, but you want to call witnesses. You can call witnesses. And when you bring your witnesses, they all give the evidence in chief. They will all be cross-examined, and they will all be re-examined. One thing I want you to note is that an accused person has the right to also put in a defense of alibi. 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 An accused can put in a defense of alibi, and this will be in a separate lecture that will be held. But it's on a section 131 of that 30, where the accused can say that my Lord, this child that I'm brought against me, they are saying that it will happen in Nima on 1st January 2022. Me, on that date, I have evidence to show that I wasn't in Ghana. I was in Singapore from 2021 all the way to 2024. And there's evidence to show it. So how can I be the one who committed this offense? The accused can prove. And so that is the import of section 175. And so what I want you to note about the addresses are that by practice, the address is at the end of the case of the defense. If the accused is represented by counsel, he may address the court on the evidence and the applicable law, urging the court to acquit the accused person. If the prosecutor too is there and is a lawyer, he may also address the court. The first party to address the court usually depends on whether the accused person has called witnesses on his defense. If the accused has called a witness, then the lawyer of the accused will address the court first. If the accused did not call the witness, and the prosecutor, if he's a lawyer, state or state attorney, shall address the court first, and the lawyer for the accused will respond. Remember that the state attorney always has the last word in addresses if he elects to do so. Let me explain this. Of course, the address will definitely come at the end of the case. Every, when everything is said and done, that's when the address will come in. So the practice is that it's supposed to come in at the end of the case for the defense. Now, what is the order in which we file the address? We will address the courts. 
if the accused person has called a witness, usually then the lawyer for the accused will address the court first. We'll sum up everything, my lord, my client is not guilty because if you look at the charge, if you look at the evidence, if you look at the law, he's not guilty. Sum up everything that I called, I seem to see, I called this person, they all said this. Sum up everything to the courts. Summarize everything. And not the law. So if accused called a witness, then the law for the accused will address the court first, then the prosecution will respond. Now, after the address is what next? Then it is time for the court to adjourn for judgment. You are saying that we've heard what you, for the prosecution you said, we've heard what the accused to you have said. So now the court will have to look at everything you have said and determine whether the accused person is guilty or not guilty. If the accused is found not guilty, he shall be acquitted and discharged. But if the accused is found guilty, it means that he will be convicted. So the court will say, accused is hereby convicted of stealing. Many people confuse conviction with sentencing, but they are different. The court can convict you today and defer sentence for the next two weeks, so that you come for sentencing in two weeks' time. It happens a lot. And it means that when I convict you, the next thing is now for me to impose the punishment. So that is why after the conviction, the accused is now given the right to plea. We make what we call a plea of clemency. So if I convict you today, the same day, you can make your plea of clemency and I can sentence you. So I'll take your plea of clemency into consideration. Why you want a lenient sentence? Then I can take that into consideration before sentencing you. So after remember, after that meant it can be not guilty. And so the accused will be acquitted and discharged. But if it is guilty, then it means the accused will be convicted. After conviction, do not equate conviction with sentence. After conviction, then the court must now pass the sentence. But before the sentence, there shall be a plea of clemency by the accused. And the prosecution too can also have their response regarding the plea of sentencing. Then after that, the court shall now pass the sentence. Then after that, the case is over. So this is the elaborate structure of what we call summary trial in Ghana. And so by way of recap, remember I dealt with first preliminary matters that the case will be called in open court. And I mentioned that in open court, when the case is called, then it means that we'll call you, find out whether the accused is in court or not. If you're not in court, then I'm going to issue a bench warrant for your arrest. All of that are supposed to be taken into consideration at the preliminary matters. Next, taking of the plea. Remember the options available to the accused person. Remember the options available to the accused person. Remember the accused can plead not guilty. And when you plead not guilty, you know the input. Section 171, subsection 4 by 30. The court shall proceed to take evidence. If he pleads guilty, section 199, the court will have to explain to him if he doesn't have a lawyer. And after the explanation, if we still maintain it, then a plea of guilty, when recorded, shall be a conviction. Remember that accused can also plead guilty with explanation. And remember, they will listen to the explanation and see whether it is consistent with the plea of guilty or not. The accused can plead double jeopardy or can plead as to jurisdiction. Now, remember we said if the accused pleads guilty, then he'll be convicted on his own plea and sentence. And this is the first mode of ending the trial. If he feels not guilty, the prosecution must give the facts of the case and the court will have to consider the issue of bill. After the bill is considered, then there has to be an adjournment. Remember adjournment. If accused is in custody, no more than 14 days. If he's on bill, no more than 30 days. But we are adjourning the ex prosecution that they should file all their disclosures at least two days before case management conference. After the case management conference, we we'll face timelines for the hearing. When we face timelines for the hearing, they will proceed to case for the prosecution. They have to come and call all their witnesses and tell us why the accused person is guilty. Each of them before testifying will have to swear an oath according to section 61 of the Evidence Act to testify nothing but the truth. When they finish calling their case, remember, calling all their witnesses, remember the last person may usually be the investigator. He's, about, he's the one that may tender the investigation conscious statement and the child conscious statement. Over there, there could be objections that it wasn't given voluntarily in breach of Section 120 of the Evidence Act. And when that happens, the courts can conduct a mini trial.
to determine the admissibility or otherwise of that statement. At the end of the case of the prosecution, remember, they may substitute or amend the charges before they close their case. Then after that one, the accused may make a submission of no case to answer if he wishes to do so. If the accused makes a submission of no case to answer and is upheld, then the accused shall be acquitted and discharged. This is the second mode of ending the trial. The first mode is when the accused is guilty and is recorded. Second mode is if a submission of no case to answer is appealed. But if the submission of no case to answer is refused, then the accused will be required to open his defense. Now, when you open your defense, you call all your witnesses one after the other. And then both parties too, after all, after the accused has called all the defenses, remember, when the case of the defense happens, it's time for the case for defense to start. Remember the options open to the accused person. You can remain silent, you can swear the oath and give evidence, or you can elect to stand in the dock without swearing the oath and give evidence. Each of them have their own implications. After accused, you finish calling your witnesses and you finish your case, then both parties will now have to address the court. So remember the order in which the addresses are found. I mean, if the accused you call witnesses, then you let the lawyer for the accused will address the court first. If not, then the prosecution will address the court first, then the accused person will respond. After the addresses, what happens? Judgment. We can be an acquittal or a conviction. After that portion, then if the accused is convicted, then there shall be plea of clemency. And if there's no plea of clemency, then it means that it, after the plea of clemency, the prosecution too will also have their say regarding the plea of clemency. Then after that stage, after that stage, then if the accused, if the court hears the plea of clemency, the next thing is for now the sentencing to be passed. You are hereby sentenced to two years in prison, three years in prison, and that will be the end of the summary trial. So this is just by way of overview in terms of a detailed procedure for summary trial in Ghana. Thank you.